Hey, this is Jay. And this is Chelsea. Welcome to the Shifting Perceptions Podcast. We are bringing you inspiration to live a more creative lifestyle because our favorite people are the ones that choose the path less traveled. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 41st episode of the Shifting Perceptions Podcast. This is Chelsea. Keeping up with our super informative entrepreneurial theme we've been running, we follow on from last week's podcast about scaling your online business with Drew Duboff by sitting down with Dale Roberts and taking a deep dive into the world of self-publishing. You may know Dale as the host of the popular YouTube channel, Self-Publishing with Dale, or as the author of over 3,000 books that are currently online. What started as a squat challenge made by his corporate wellness coach ended in Dale's desire to share his knowledge of fitness with other people. He set about writing a book that would help others on their fitness journey, and the rest is history. For the past five years, Dale has built up a lucrative career by self-publishing his own books. When people noticed his business go from zero to 60, he received many questions from other would-be authors and realized the demand for a knowledgeable and experienced coach in the field of self-publishing. Ever the innovator, Dale decided to create a YouTube channel that is devoted to building a successful self-publishing business in which he shares his experiences. We got advice from Dale on how to get started in the world of self-publishing, as well as other ways budding entrepreneurs can create additional streams of income. Dale focuses his business model on book publishing, video production, and public speaking, and stresses the importance of giving value in everything that you do. This conversation is full of useful insights and advice on self-publishing and monetizing what you're passionate about. You're going to like it, I promise. Hey guys, this is Jay Alders. A couple of quick things. If you have not yet clicked subscribe on your podcast player, please do that right now. Um, Yeah, so I just did another limited edition poster for the band 311. Uh, You know them. They do songs like this. And uh, yeah, they're awesome. I've done about four posters for them, and this one is... I only have a couple of couple left actually. I released it yesterday, and they almost sold out. So I think there's about uh, ten left or eleven left, and you can go on jalders.com slash three eleven if you want to check that out. Um, in other news, I also have been having some cool flash sales on my Instagram and my Facebook. So if you're looking to get a really good uh, last minute deal on some artwork, go to my Instagram or. Facebook, you can find me at J Alders. And thank you guys for all of the great reviews. We had a review from Reden- Re- I'm going to say this terribly. Redentesky. Redentesky. Sorry, I said that horribly. Um, and this person says, I really liked that not one episode is the same. One made me laugh, another made me think hard. The topic of conversation varies so much that you're always engaged and wanting to listen more. Keep it up, guys. Well, thank you very much, Redent, <laughs> Redent, Redeneski. Holy smokes. Uh, we got another one from Handmade Jewelry Haven. Uh, love the chill vibe I get when I listen to this podcast on my way to work. Totally puts me in the right mindset for my day, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. So yeah, thank you guys for um, connecting with us so much. Our Instagram is now up to over 11,000 followers, which we're just stoked about. So thank you for that. And uh, on that note, let's jump in. Amanda. Chelsea. <laughs> Chelsea. Super close. <laughs> <I'm>, you know, <laughs> the funny thing is I was just looking at someone's name said Amanda and I just said it out loud. <laughs> well, One of those 80s babies names. That's Chelsea, all. <laughs> Chelsea, you know, the thing is now your name's Amanda from this day. Okay, forward, great. So that's fine. Awesome. That's that's fine. fine. <laughs> well, we'll buy her like a, a red wig and I'll call her Amanda tonight and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Hey, Amanda. <laughs> anyway, how are you? How you doing, Thanks man? for rescheduling. Ooh. Live and kicking. Oh, hey, not an issue, man. It's I tell you, when the shit hits the fan, the shit hits the fan. Yeah, so, yeah. telling us, preach yeah. it, brother, preach it. Hey, not not an issue. I, although I did talk to Steve Scott, he says he's never heard of you. Yeah, <laughs> no, totally kidding, man. Actually, he funny because he was, he was totally with cool. us this weekend. <laughs> actually, just saw him at the beach. He told yeah. me he talked to you. Oh, nice, nice, nice. Yeah, he's he's a good dude, man. I, I'll tell you, man. I swear, my timing is always off with this dude. Uh, probably about a couple years ago, okay. I was like, hey, would love to interview you for my channel. And uh, he kind of came back and was like, ah, I'm not really doing the whole self-publishing thing. I'm kind of focusing on my habits brand. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I go and I see he's got a YouTube channel. I was like, get out of here. He's got a YouTube channel. I go over and I was like, hey, man, 
you know, would love to kind of get you over, you know, talk with you, maybe, uh, you know, help boost your channel. And he was just like, ah, not really doing the YouTube thing. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> what did you guys chat about then? Uh, we just—it was just a, a brief exchange via messenger, so oh, okay. nothing, nothing too in depth. Got and it. I, I gotta, you know, be honest. You know, obviously, he's probably just Scott to you. Uh, he's just to Scott me, to us. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's mega superstar to me. Like, uh, this is a guy. That <laughs> I told I him that he—he he like I, I was like, yeah, I think Dell's kind of like a fanboy, and he was—he got all blushed up and was like, I don't understand that. <laughs> he's like, I don't know how to take it when people do that. <laughs> he is like, it's just so funny. I mean, he—he's actually the reason Jay and I are together. Um, no kidding. Wow, yeah. that's so awesome. We man. know him that- way pre for. Pre way way pre Scott. Steve Scott yeah, yeah. it was very, actually kind of a pretty. shock to us we're yeah. like we're like wait a minute you have a pen name what the hell is going on here <laughs> yeah it's so crazy I, I I love the backstory of how he ended up sharing how he ended up getting the pen name because being creeped out by people uh, yes showing up to his doorstep uh, that's yeah. why Kelly actually uh, primary one of the main reasons why we live where we're at we live in a secure community you know you okay. have to get in like it's security at night. Our garage is completely locked up and in building. Uh, it's because all of the self story. publishers are bombarding your house, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah you Teach know, us how it, to publish. It, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Even that bald guy that talks about self publishing all the time and you're really loud, right? Ah, I'm going to come wear your face. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Um, we do want to like hear about how this happened, Dale, because I feel like that wasn't your initial intention, right? To end up in self-publishing. Are we on now? Is that what's happening? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. We're, we're recording. We this are. Amazing. Let's do it. Is there any better way to start? Surprise. So, uh, yeah, you know, the, the funny thing is, you know, uh, I, you are right on the money. I, it was never an intention to get into self-publishing, Chelsea. I'm not sure if you had, we're, we're already kind of spying on me or saw any other interviews, my intention really was just to fulfill a challenge by a corporate wellness coach. I'd worked in the healthcare industry for 20 years and primarily as an activities director, I was paid to play. And I've always been big about fitness. I'm really big about health and fitness. And my corporate wellness coach could not challenge me enough. I mean, I would do like, you know, she would say, uh, how many squats can you do straight? I was like, oh, let's see if I can do a thousand. And I would do a thousand squats straight. Like, what do you got next? And then it, it became ridiculous proportions till she was like, you know, it would be really awesome if you would share what you know about health and fitness by writing a book. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do that because I'd always wanted to write a book. It wasn't until probably about a year into me writing this book and looking into publishing it myself. And I was looking at local printers and things like that, that I stumbled over create space and create space at the time, an Amazon owned company. They, uh, they had this opportunity for self-publishing for no money. I was like, this is a no brainer. I'm going to be on Amazon too. I'm like, all right. So I accidentally stumbled on that. And when I first got my first paycheck, it was $23 and some odd cents. Baller. Yeah. (laughs) Dude, I know, I know I'll take you two out to to eat one of these days. Uh, (laughs) Drinks are on me, except you're only allowed to order water. Fair Uh, enough. (laughs) At any rate, uh, yeah, it was, it was proof of concept to me. And that was all I really needed. And it just happened to be a circumstance that I loved my job but I love my wife way more than I love my job. And I felt this, this distance that was being put between us and the job was the one that was there. So this opportunity of self-publishing kind of came up and my brain said, quit your job. And, and I did, by the way, folks, I I don't, I don't recommend that. (laughs) It's never a good idea. I don't either for the record. (laughs) Yes. Yes. A couple years of, of really uh, tough times, but after we got through about the first year and a half to two years, it started getting better. And, where we're at today, I'm super happy with that. So what were you spending that first like two years doing? So you were self-publishing, but what were you? So you did he was health doing and thousands of squats. Oh, right. <laughs> thousands of squats, yeah. exactly. As many squats as you could in two years. Got it. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, well, you know, um, in that time, I was really trying to soak up the business. And I was, this is during kind of the Kindle Publishing gold rush where everyone was going and you would just churn out any kind of garbage, publish it and make money hand and fist. Unfortunately, I, the writer's side of me couldn't settle on just putting out hammered garbage onto the market. And I really wanted to publish really good stuff. So I, it was just a case of trial and error. Um, I tried to just pretty much, for lack of better words, spray and pray. I was writing in various 
That niches so and hoping okay. for the best. <laughs> and it wasn't until I actually I hired a coach. The gentleman's name was Jason Brock. Um, funny, I was just talking to him just before we got on here. And uh, Jason spent some time with me and really gave me direction and got it to where I understood the business so much better. And you know, he, he looked at me and pretty much was just like, what are your highest performing assets? And I would point it out to him, double down on that. So I think okay. that's like a hard thing to recognize in yourself too, because I'm sure those highest performing ones did not always align with the things you enjoyed doing the most. You know, I didn't deviate too far from okay. things I'm passionate on. So, um, but the, the, actually the ones that actually did the best, I, I loved. Now, right now, it's, it, it continues to be the fitness brand, which is, you know, kind of slowly but surely died a horrible death because I've paid <laughs> less attention to it over the past couple of years. And I've been focused more on the self-publishing with Dale brand. And uh, the reason why I took a step away from it was I just got burnt out. I just, there's only so many ways you could teach people how to do push-ups before you're like, okay, I, I've <laughs> right. already said all this. <laughs> so were you YouTubing workout stuff too, or this was just the writing side? Um, it was just the writing side and I was dabbling in the YouTube arena. Um, okay. I didn't know what I was doing. And it, it was one of those cases of, I thought I'd put videos up and they would just become viral. I mean, don't we all do that? Of Isn't that course. right? You get on just, YouTube and you yeah, become viral. That's how it works. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sadly, I, I found out real quick that it didn't work in that capacity. And I learned it even more so when I broke into sharing people the information I knew about self-publishing right about March to April of 2016. Um, I'd already, you know, pretty much got some pretty good success. It was about January 2016 when I, I really saw my best performing month. And I was like, okay, this is great. Well, I started getting interviews and people were asking me, like I was getting DMs on, you know, Twitter. Facebook, uh, email, um, and people were wanting to know how I was doing it. And rather than saying the same answer over and again, I was like, well, let me just do a YouTube channel. I'll send people over to the videos and they can learn that way. And I'll become a viral superstar. <laughs> dump, dump, dump. So Dale, so self-publishing, there is so much information out there on it yet. I'm, I'm guaranteeing that there's people listening that are like, what the hell is self-publishing? So, so I've been working on a book and then one of the inevitable questions that comes up is, yeah. Are you getting published? Do you have a publisher? Like people don't really, a lot of people don't know what self-publishing is. Can you kind of paint a picture for people? This is why I love you guys' podcast. I've been listening to it and consuming it for the last couple of months. You guys have a quite an extensive backlog. You always ask the more basic questions so that way everybody understands. And this is an awesome one in the fact that not everybody knows what self-publishing is or they have that, uh, the, the stigma of self-publishing. So self-publishing means this, when I talk about it, it's more about publishing books than it is about, say, self-publishing videos or other types of content. But self-publishing essentially means to publish your own content versus trying to find an agent. Get that agent to find a traditional publishing deal that's through a large publishing house. Uh, pray for the best. Get a lot of rejections. Eventually, you know, give up. You know, that type of thing. The barrier of entry is far lower. It's far uh, than what we're used to with the traditional publishing model. So that's where, where self-publishing comes in. Now, the stigma that's there is self-publishing has been around for a long, 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 long time. It, well before this modern day model, and I'll talk about the modern day model in just a second, when Self-publishing was around, say, a few decades ago. You used to have this weird uncle that would come and do, like, you know, meet up in the reunions, you know, it kind of smelled slightly off, maybe like too much Old Spice. And he would say he had a garage full of books. Like, I just published my own book. I self-published my own book. And you're just kind of like, <laughs> ooh. Well, there's where that stigma was at. It was believed to be less than. It was believed to be inferior to what you would normally see in bookstores. And through the traditional publishing houses. But that model has changed so, so much. And why is that? Because of the modern day self publishing model. And the modern day version really started off right about in 2008 when Kindle Direct Publishing launched. And this was Amazon's little baby that allowed independent authors the opportunity to publish their eBooks through their platform. And it started to grow and 
this, this information started getting around and people was like, oh my gosh, I don't need to go through an agent or a traditional publishing deal. I can just do this myself and I make more money. Well, this is a no brainer. Let me just go do this self-publishing model. And it's scaled and it's grown even bigger to where people can actually do print on demand uh, publishing for, say, their paperback books or their hardback books, and then even downloadable audiobooks. So the modern day self publishing model has grown so much bigger, and that stigma is starting to fall off because people are starting to become more aware of this very unique model. Well, so talk about what that looks like in regards to. Um the outside career, like, okay, that's how you publish the book and it gets out there. I think people's real fear is that if they don't go with a publishing house, they're not going to be able to like go for book signings, go on tour, like do public speaking, like the whole career doesn't exist without it. So what does that look like in a self-publishing model? Well, because of the self-publishing model, the way it is right now, here's the deal is traditional publishing is starting to recognize that model. And they're starting to understand that, oh, we can vet out our deals before we even offer them something? Well, yeah, let's go ahead and do this. So you have the likes of, say, an E.L. James, you know, famous for the Fifty Shades of Grey books. Yeah. She was self-published coming into this. And she's one of those poster childs for the whole self-publishing movement. And so traditional publishing deals are now starting to look for people that have that built-in following, that they already have that proof of concept. And when it comes to actually doing the same things as traditional publishing, just as simple. You know, you're going, well, I wouldn't, I don't want to brush that under the rug. And it's not like it's easy to go over and get speaking gigs yeah. uh, or anything like that. But, you know, you're able to still do the speaking gigs. You're still able to do the author appearances. You may even be able to even hire an agent to take care of that or a manager that will handle that type of booking. Um, so you still have the same opportunities available to you. And again, you're able to profit more. You're able to keep more and take more home with you having those opportunities. And the funny thing is you could be self-published as an author and say, well, I'm a published author and that's still going to get you some amazing opportunities between media appearances and speaking at conferences. It's so interesting because we actually met with someone who is like a booking agent for um, public speaking. And we had mentioned Jay was going to self-publish. And it was like actually uncomfortable. Like she was just like, well, Why would you do that? <laughs> maybe the corner bookshop down the street would let you talk there. But you're not going to be able to get anything like nationwide or like any basically reach like she was just kind of like you know the people I work with speak at like Yale because they have a publishing deal and I'm like I just feel like it's changing like that <laughs> yeah. doesn't feel right anymore you know it's really interesting for for that you know and I'm gonna push back this a little bit I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the devil's advocate of something like that yeah I understand probably where she's coming from because that is the universe that she has surrounded herself yes. in that she's been a bubble apart right. I'm not trying to downplay what her experience has been but on the flip side of things, I know that, you know, if for some reason Jay decides to self-publish and he wants to get that, he is intelligent and articulate enough that if he were to talk to the right people, all it's going to take is just getting on in there and saying, here's my book. Here's why it brings value to your organization. And here's why I'm going to send your eyebrows when I come in there and speak at your organization. You <laughs> don't need a traditional publisher to do that. The, the bottom line is this, is if you're passionate enough, people will sense that. There's a good reason why I, I, I get on as much podcast. People are like, oh my gosh, dude, you're awesome. Like, it's because I'm passionate about what I talk about. And if you can be the same way or be at least slightly uncomfortable, step outside your comfort zone and get it to where you can share your passion with other people, people will sense that. People feed off of positive energy. And that's going to be what's going to really get you in speaking gigs. And I'm sure, you know, many people will probably push back with their own type of argument, but I've seen so many success stories within the self-publishing community that to say you wouldn't be able to get speaking gigs at Yale or something else, I think that's fairly short-sighted. And it's really, it's kind of demeaning your value as a human being and a person who can actually bring value to everyone, regardless of where you're publishing through. 
So Dale, so for someone listening that is either considering writing a book or has a book they're looking to publish or self-publish, let's get into the weeds of the, the monetization because it doesn't take a heck of a lot of research to, to notice and to see that uh, the margins are very slim in this type of a business. And it, if you don't do everything correctly and you don't have the proper volume, it is kind of hard to make money. But on the other side of it, there are so many opportunities, which you sort of alluded to already. Like I know some some published authors that are making much more money in public speaking, or the book gave them enough clout to open doors that they normally would not have had opened. And as you do with like YouTube, with publishing, with all the different avenues that, that you seek out, can you talk about that? Like if someone's on the fence about writing a book, but they, they found a YouTube video that says you can only make a, a dollar or two dollars per book, like why should, why they sh- should they bother doing this at all? You, for lack of better ways of of putting this is there are going to be some people that will recommend that you bargain basement price your books. So that way you gain the favor of searchability. You know, obviously if it's lower price, obviously more people are going to buy it. And then of course you're going to become more searchable, say through a distributor like Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Apple, you know, so on and so forth. But then again, you know, that, ultimately it's going to be up to you on how you price it and how the value that you're going to, you know, put forth when it comes to like, say your book description. And I mean, that's where a lot of people I think fall short is they sometimes see, well, this other person's pricing their book 99 cents in my niche. I get a price 99 cents too. No, 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 that's not true. If you really believe that your product is great, you know, price it where you think the value is at. And then from there, you're going to need to address and adjust uh, your value proposition. You need to kind of get it to where that book description is going to sell. So there's the lower price, you know, as far as the, the profit per sale, you know, now let's just pretend like you can only profit a dollar per, let's just say that. So there are, there's many ways to monetize your entire author brand beyond the book, because the book is just, I would say it's the entry level and you, you've probably had a few guests on here where they talk about sales funnels and such to where, you know, you have that entry level product that brings people into your specific brand. And that is what you're going to need to think about with your book, because we need to start to expand beyond that. And it could be something simple as putting different product offerings like merchandise. So you've watched a few of my videos. You see the shirts I wear that is just kind of passive income. I just wear these shirts normally. So people see that over, say, in my Teespring store through YouTube, or they'll go over to Amazon and they'll find that and buy that. So that's just another way to monetize it. But if you go further down into the funnel, you're going to look at other things we've already kind of addressed being speaking engagements, online course creation. uh, Let's see here, uh, online summits, Uh, coaching. There's so many ways you can make it shake it or bake it that if you just looked at the books, yeah, you know, it's going to be really tough to make a living at just that, especially at first. But if you can think about how much more you can build off of your brand, then you're going to start to get it. Okay. I can get affiliate deals. I can get sponsorships or brand deals. Um, I can, you know, do appearances. I can speak at different places. So it's, this is limitless, so many ways. So that's what I recommend to anybody that is a currently self-publishing their own books or building their author brand is expand beyond the books. It's okay for you to make money outside of writing. I know I'm giving you permission right now. You can make money beyond just the books. Hello, everyone. I just want to take a minute and give a bit of a shout out and plug for our sponsor, Beauty Counter. Um, I'm a consultant for this company. Um, It basically all was spawned out of the horrifying statistics that we got to know as we learned about this um, six-year-old company out of Santa Monica. Our current regulations are terrifying and basically haven't been updated since World War II. And so there have been about 80,000 new chemicals introduced into our products be it cleaning products, skincare products, makeup, etc. They're basically completely unregulated. We started transferring our house over about four years ago. And this brand 
has never come out with a product I don't like. We completely love it. Jay uses the entire men's line. We did a little plug for it as a live video the other day and got a great response. So I just wanted to also put up an offer that we are currently giving away a free Jay Alders poster of your choice. You get to choose any piece you like for any orders over $200 um, off of beautycounter.com forward slash Chelsea Alders. You do have to use our website. So again, that's beautycounter.com forward slash Chelsea Alders. Thanks so much. So let's talk about the money. So you're, you're in this enough to know what the average person might be making. What can someone expect as like an average or maybe people you've dealt with? What are the, what are like the upper and lower ends of the spectrum? What's sort of the median amount? What might a person expect as like a realistic number? If you're not someone like our friend Scott, that's like raking in six figures a month. (laughs) Yes. Love that guy. Uh, so you know, this was actually something I covered just last week uh, live on my channel where I talked a bit about some of the reports that you're going to see coming out. The biggest issue when it comes to some of these reports, they're surveys, and they're only covering just a small chunk of the actual publishing community. Not everyone's answering this. So you're going to find some reports that say, you know, I think there was one that I saw from about five years ago that said that the average was $500 per year. That's scary. That I, I, I couldn't live off that. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Nowhere in the world could I live off $500 per year. Um, and then you got other reports that say it's upwards of say 20 grand to 40 grand per year. So it's, it's pretty good. And then you have that 1% that are pulling in say $100,000 or more per year. So it, it really varies. My experience, I've met a lot of indie authors and there are some that are still functioning in the red. And then there are some that they just get it within their first year of the business. They're pulling in, I would say average of like say three grand to five grand per month. And that's, that's decent. Yeah, that's nice. Especially if you're adding on other revenue streams. So how about uh, as much as you would like to um, uh, be transparent, what about yourself? Like you you have the the books, you've got the YouTube stuff, which I'm sure you're you're uh, working on monetizing. As I see, you've got some merchandise stuff going on. What for you has become some of the bigger streams, and and where's your focus going now? Uh, you know, it, it's <laughs> I have so many hoses going into my bucket that whoa, it, 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 it's, you know, we, this could get really dark here. Sorry, uh, <laughs> there is so many things that are going into that revenue sh- uh, stream. Um, that, you know, to be honest, publishing pulls in quite a bit, um, you know, cause I have right about North of 3000 publications online right now. Um, because I tell people I'm an indie author, but I'm also a publisher. So for instance, I've built this out to many different types of assets, everything from print books, be it paperback or hardback to eBooks, to audiobooks, downloadable audiobooks, And I've even expanded out to even more recently, uh, creating DVDs, believe it or not, people still buy those. It's a DVD. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Can you tell the audience what a DVD is? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Yeah, you know, um, there's so many, so many opportunities that are available. Wait, so, so what? Say, what books? What are we talking about here? Because I know when we talked on the phone about a month ago, you were telling me uh-huh. about your fitness book, and we talked about that. What are these other thousands of? Are you just publishing things? other people? Is that what you mean? You're like you're correct. So, yeah, um, publisher. you know, I've written underneath ghost names, uh, uh, pen names. Excuse me. Okay. And those probably make up a fair chunk right there. So um, I've done some humor and satire books underneath a pen name. I've done some fiction books before. Okay. I've also hired out ghost writers um, for doing different pen names and such. So and anytime that I'm doing some of these, I try to find something I'm passionate about. So for instance, um, I like to study uh, Reiki. I'm not sure if you're familiar with yeah. Reiki. Totally. Um, but my mother's a Reiki master teacher. And so I have at least a tenuous grasp on it. And I find it very intriguing and interesting. So I went out and I found some people that I can actually write about that. And people that actually, I found a Reiki teacher master out in the UK about a few years ago. And uh, she wrote like just a fantastic piece for me. And it still is a nice little asset that collects some good passive income. Uh, you know, there's a variety of things. The other one is, and this is something Jay and I, uh, we haven't probably talked about was the no content, low content book arena. And this is one that will kind of blow you away, which is essentially think of journals, notebooks, diaries, planners, 
uh, it, anything like a activity or a workbook, things that don't require a lot of work in the interior so much as it say like a graphic design standpoint. So that's no content, low content books. I started dabbling in it in about 2015. I went all in on it in 2016. And that really was another like area that just exploded for me. And now it's starting to kind of come to the forefront because my wife has been a champion for the cause when it comes to the no content and low content books. And uh, she, you know, was all me, you know, becoming successful with it. And then she, of course, naturally, and I'm sure JD can relate to this, you know, the wife goes and just perfects the model and makes it like, you know, bring in tons of revenue. So uh, she just completely crushes it in that that arena. So Um, where are you selling the like journals and that kind of stuff? That's interesting. That's through Amazon. That's okay. actually through Amazon. Yeah, it's a super simple process. Um, I, I don't want to make it sound like it's easy, um, but the it's okay uh, to have some things that are a little easier. <laughs> everything doesn't have to be a thousand uh, squats. Yeah, <laughs> right. Not a thousand squats, nor do you have to write a thousand words, or much less ten thousand or a hundred thousand words. That's the whole premise of say no content, low content books. And there is a voracious audience. And here's one of the really really cool things. You typically will buy a book and you're done with it. So I've got a few books on my shelf. Maybe I'll go back and I'll reread them, but I'm not going to go and buy them again. The beauty of no content and low content books is it's, it's evergreen. People are going to fill up a book. Oh, I love this particular planner that's made available through Dale's company. So I'm going to go ahead and buy another one. And, you know, I loved it so much. I'm going to buy 10 of them. I'm going to give them out to some friends and family. So you can kind of see where this business is a little bit different. And I, I know that some people within the indie publishing business kind of sneered at it in the same way that, you know, we kind of get that stigma of self-publishing from traditional publishing. They're going to go, oh, well, this, this, is, this is, you know, oh, that's not publishing. Yeah, it's a different product. It's a different type of skew than, say, if you were to write a fiction novel. Yeah. Um, two different things. But, you know, for the most part, though, it's, it's a nice little business, and if you take it seriously, it'll reward you handsomely. It, it's definitely, a, yeah, it's definitely a great business move. I, I've read a little bit about it recently. I'm wondering, I'm wondering, like, when does it get too saturated, though? Like, how many journals and low content books can there possibly be before they're just like, okay, we have enough. I've, I have a journal. I'm good to go. Yeah, it, it's. It, I guess that is the real question. I, I honestly, I think it's going to get to the point because there, there is a big rush for this right now. People are uploading literally thousands per day. I do not recommend that. That's, that's just not a good strategy. And eventually, and this is primarily happening through Amazon, Amazon's going to kind of put their foot down and they're going to be going, okay, if these aren't proven concepts, if these aren't selling, ultimately Amazon's not happy. And if Amazon's not happy, they're going to find some way to kind of lock it down. So I think eventually, yeah, it'll probably get to that point where they're going to have like, say, upload limits. Um, And, you know, um, the current crop of indie authors that are truly coming at this business um, with a good heart are going to suffer from that because the people that are coming in for this gold rush are just coming in to make their big, quick paycheck and then leave. You know, for me, This is not a quick paycheck. This is a business I love, and I'm going to plan on staying around for more years to come. Do you find that the the business for you is more the YouTube side or more of this this uh, product based publishing side, or is it kind of both one and the same or equal to you? It's it's turned into a two headed beast. Ain't going to lie to you. Um, I, I think probably over the past few months. The YouTube presence and just the self-publishing with Dale Brand is starting to match that income that I'm pulling in from cool. actually publishing the books. Um, I'm very fortunate in the position that I am. I'm uh, what's called a bronze level YouTuber. Um, and that means that I have have over 10,000 subscribers over on YouTube. Uh, being part of the YouTube Partner Program, I'm going to let everybody know, uh, you don't get paid very well for AdSense, folks. And, uh, I've even shared some of, you know, my CPM with, uh, other YouTubers in private. And I guess that I actually make a little more than what some people do. So I'll tell you this, that if I had to rely on AdSense alone, I'd probably go broke, but there are other opportunities such as, you know, sometimes when I've had sponsors for my videos or 
I've even had say affiliate programs. Um, those, those take care of me and those actually start to build up. And the, the nice thing is, um, I'm getting again, so many revenue uh, sources coming in. I, I was going to say the hoses in the bucket thing, but you guys started laughing. And, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm still stuck on this, on the spray. It was that okay, one. Like, stop it. Pr- spray no. it and pray. This it. So inappropriate. Still... <laughs> 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 Can you, uh, all right, so let's get into the, into the details here. So someone has a, an idea for a book or they have a book. What, sort of steps are involved? Like let's demystify the whole process. The very first step, and this is the one I see most people get hung up on is create the content, write the content first. If you've never written the book, don't worry about the next steps. Don't worry about your marketing plan. Don't worry about an editor. Don't worry about a book cover or your book description or your price point or setting up a website. None of that. Just write the content. I've had so many people that have come up to me, say like a couple years before, and they'll say, oh, what do I do? I'd be like, write the book. They come back, you know, later on and they're going, uh, you know, so, so what do I do? What, what do I do? I'm like, did you write your book? No. Uh, but I was thinking about, you know, maybe having a different cover and, and I'm like, don't worry about that. Just write it first. And I am giving 100% permission to everyone listening to this. You can write any type of garbage you want to just allow mm-hmm. yourself the ability to write without any judgment inside your head, because that's what a lot of people run into is they're too busy thinking about this perfect product that's in their mind. And as they start to write it out, they either become stuck through writer's block or they get stuck having to hit the backspace of the delete multiple times, just trying to get their first draft out. First draft should always be the worst draft. Just get that on out the way. Um, It's tough for me. As I'm pointing one finger forward, there's three pointed back at me here. And the reason is I am just as guilty from hitting that backspace. I will, I get into, I start to get into a flow and I'll be like, oh, I misspelled that. Or, oh, that wasn't the right word. But I'm getting better. And I think that if you find you practice every day at writing, you're going to get better every day at writing. So that's your first step. Write the book. Next step is going to be finding a good editor. And this is where you're going to make sure that you're surrounding yourself with other people that are like-minded or inside this business already. So find a good indie author community, be it on Facebook, LinkedIn, any kind of forums, just connect with them and get referrals for someone who's willing to edit your work. And your editor should not be your friend. Okay. It shouldn't be your mom. It shouldn't be your closest cousin or your, your next door neighbor. mom would be a terrible editor. Can you, editor, you <laughs> imagine my mom Jeez, being an mom. editor? Oh, my God. I can attest <laughs> to the editor thing. I have a developmental editor, and I learned during the writing process of my book, there are like yeah. 14 million different types of editors. It's yep. unbelievable. But, yeah, my, my editor is incredible, and she definitely comes off at times as like, oh my God, you're not giving me more work. Are you serious? But it's, it's made my book like worlds better, exponentially better yeah. just by pushing that bar up higher and higher and higher. So uh, let's, let's assume everyone has the, the book it's written, it's edited, it's great content. I want to sort of really explain to people in a, in a understandable way. You've got this file okay, now what do you do? You're not giving it to a traditional publisher. You're not giving it to an agent. You know, you could talk about, I know like there's Ingram Spark, there's Lulu's, all these different types of yeah. services. What are these things? How do they work? You know, can someone feel comfortable doing it on their own? Um, yeah, talk about that a little, Dale. Okay, so let's just assume you've got it edited. You have your file ready to rock and roll. I always recommend to newbie authors, um, figure out what is your end goal? Where, where do you want to be? What do you want to get from this? And most instances, about 99% of the time, a lot of people just want to be published. They just want to get their stuff out there and hopefully make some money in return. So I say go to where most of the people are congregating and most of the people being the browsing customers, the readers, and that would be Amazon. Amazon's one of the world's largest online retailers. And If you can find that path, that's great. There's numerous ways to get on Amazon, but I'm going to give you the path of least resistance. And that's through Kindle Direct Publishing. You've got two different iterations you can publish your book through. It's through ebook 
and print book through the Kindle Direct Publishing platform. By the way, if I say KDP, it's just Kindle Direct Publishing for short. So get it through that avenue. Now, there are numerous tutorials that you can take advantage of, like you can watch my channel, or something as simple as KDP Jumpstart. Uh, KDP Jumpstart is an online course that Amazon offers, and it walks you through all the process of how do you format your book? How do you upload it? What type of keywords do you need to do? Um, I've gone through the course myself. You know, a lot of people probably think I'm insane because I already know this stuff, but I think it never hurts to kind of hear exactly how they want it in their own words. And so Amazon's KDP Jumpstart, free program, walk you all through it. And then you can kind of get a good idea as to how to do it from A all the way down to Z. So that way you're not missing any steps and you know exactly what to do. Once you upload to KDP for the first time, it's going to seem nerve wracking and you hit that publish button. You kind of like, you're going to tense up a little bit <laughs> and then you finally hit that publish button. Uh, it's, it's going to be a relief. You're going to feel better. And it's, it's a very fun process, but as soon as you do it at least once, you're going to find it gets easier with each time that you publish a book. And also let's just say, for instance, you publish a book there and you're like, I'm not too impressed with Amazon KDP. Well, at least you have the experience of knowing exactly what to do, what to look for, because then you can look at other platforms like an Ingram Spark or a Lulu or any of the other aggregate publishers that are out there. What are we looking at as in terms of numbers with these other publishers? Like, are they even coming close to these Kindle things or these Amazon owned programs? Or is it like, like, I don't know those other companies, but are they just as big? Uh, you know, it comes down to availability and, you know, product offerings. So here, here's a fun one. Yeah, no, they're not going to touch Amazon. And I don't think it's going to be any time soon. In fact, probably the, and I'm just remembering off the top of my head, the closest competitor is Apple okay, when it comes course. to okay. eBooks. And they don't even have print books. All they have is eBooks and audiobooks. Yeah. So they're already kind of hamstrung anyways. Um, it will probably be game changing if Apple ever dis- decides to break into print on demand. But, you know, when it comes to the other... Uh, opportunities. Uh, Ingram Spark's probably going to be one nice area because here's a fun fact. KDP actually uses Ingram Content Group, also the parent owners of Ingram Spark. They use Ingram Content Group for their expanded distribution, which it is probably the widest distribution for print media there is today. They reach out everywhere. And the nice thing with Ingram Spark, kind of putting KDP off to the side here, is if you go through Ingram Spark, you can actually get brick and mortar store distribution. So if you want to get into the local mom and pop, you know, store, Ingram Spark's one of the ways to do it. Or if you want to get over into Barnes and Noble, Ingram Spark's one of the ways to do it. So it just varies per platform. And sometimes they have unique offerings. So for instance, Lulu, they have different types of products outside of just the normal paperback and hardback. They actually have calendars available. Um, They have planners. They have so many different things available for print on demand. So it offers, it offers so much more than say, if you were just to go with KDP alone. Hmm. That's interesting. So uh, yeah, what I'm wondering is if someone's going with um, a traditional publisher, Mm -hmm. can, can people switch off to, uh, self-publish? Can you go back and forth? You said earlier that there's definitely the route of doing self-publishing and then going to traditional. But if someone does stick to the idea of I'm definitely going with a traditional publisher, doesn't the publisher kind of own your your rights to your book at that point? Or, or is that not true? It varies per agreement. Uh, so this is going to be something that you're going to want to have a lawyer look through your paperwork. If you've already uh, signed an agreement, you may or may not be allowed to self-publish some stuff. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mention big uh, YouTuber. His name's Evan Carmichael. Uh, fantastic guy, by the way. you got to check out his channel. He actually is what we call a hybrid publisher. He has a traditional publishing deal, and I think it's through Penguin House, and he also self-publishes other content. So he has something within his agreement that allows him the freedom to publish outside of that traditional publishing deal 
and they're okay with that. That's interesting. And actually, I can't remember the report. Darn it! I, I mentioned this last week. Uh, hybrid publishers actually make a bit more than say someone who is just traditional publishing or someone who's just self-publishing, having the best of both worlds. So I have a question. So with you having all these different projects and all these so-called hoses and buckets, um, (laughs) (laughs) do you have like a team in place that you use or it's each project is going off to different people? Like, do you have artists you work with? Do you have an editor you always use or are you doing everything by yourself? Uh, A lot of it I do myself, um, but I do lean on some good cover designers uh, from time to time. I've probably got about a pool of about four or five that I rely on. Okay. I try doing the covers myself, but I just got to be honest with you. It's hit. They're they're, they're bad. No no matter how many times (laughs) I try to do my own covers, they're not the greatest. But I do know I can always get a good rough sketch of what I want for a cover. And I'll hand it over to a cover designer and they can typically just make it look good okay. um for, for lack of better words they they make chicken salad out of chicken shit yeah so, <laughs> delicious <All right. laughs> um as far as editors um you see now the last written book that i put out myself has been over two years ago and my editor has since um moved on to other things and i don't think i'm going to be able to contract her so i'm in between editors and in between writing books i will be putting together eventually one Thanks about self-publishing here. This I'm sure like, by the end know, of the year, I'm hoping. Space them um, out a little and I'll probably bit. get so, summertime's a little settle bit on one summertime editor, schedule. Uh, but I do have some yeah, good editors. Yeah, we're a little There are some moment, good go-tos to be totally within honest, this industry. Everyone's on vacation. Uh, kind of, no one has a steady a schedule, so it's kind of so why should me, we? But yeah, I got a few people that I pull from. And so Dale um, Roberts, if you ever want to know Dale personally, you can always just publishing direct friend. We had to cancel on him the week before. My car broke down. I was just awesome. driving home. Dale, this has been great. And, uh, uh, my car I've decided really to die in the middle of the I just of learned traffic. so yeah. much. And we have a lot of questions on fun. Jay's personal side. Then, uh, Your car died. Our well, yeah, Dale, uh, died Dale was kind of having a nice talk with me about a month ago. I fell into a very deep rabbit hole when I took the kids to the pool. I was sitting there on my phone for like hours. Literally watching the kids, all three things. But I was like, had like. And then the next day we woke up and it was like, can you imagine? very helpful. Gone, your and your car was fixed. You have a lot of great information. And I was like, well, that and, was a very um, efficient disaster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we rescheduled our podcast with Dale Roberts. Let know yeah. before we go. So, so Dale was Oh, uh, yeah, you can actually uh, check I found more Dale, of as me, I mentioned, uh, on YouTube. Self publishing with Dale.com. Like, book that's writing mode for a long time that's now. And uh, all to do with if you are YouTube, considering podcasts, writing a book, to everything else in between, crossed your mind at some point, I want to check out his YouTube videos. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dale. This is great hours of them. They're really helpful in a lot of different topics. And there's definitely not as big of a. Uh, a barrier to entry with writing a book like there used to be yeah i think that's the coolest part is just like you kind of feel like oh like i can do all of this on my own and for those of you out there who are like what if i can just like google how to self-publish it actually is possible now whereas before like we talked about in this interview too like i feel like every time we and we mentioned we're going to self-publish people are like oh well then you're not really a writer it didn't really like stick that we were really doing a real thing it's weird all these things are changing we met that girl in asbury remember that high school girl she was about to go to college with like that tattooed girl what, at the end at the end of the show at oh the yeah, asbury yeah. Show. yeah she yeah. was she she said um i was like hey you know what do you want to do with your your art because she's going to study and she said well probably my i'm sure she's seen this on youtube because everyone's saying this i'm sure my job has not even been invented yet and it's like strange because so much of this stuff is changing like self-publishing is no longer this secret voodoo thing that you have to, you know, be lucky enough to get discovered. You could just it wasn't make your even own a secret book voodoo and... thing. Like it, it was like, oh yeah, to get discovered, to, get, to be published. Yeah, or yeah. like, but with... it, I liked his metaphor of just like it was your creepy uncle. Like, oh, come on, I published right. a book. <laughs> And it was actually funny. I was the whole time I was thinking we like actually had someone like no names, but like someone who was that guy who like came to us with like this like self published book just about funny things he said in his life, and that was like that exact moment. Oh, yes. And right. he was just like, these are funny things I've said. And he like was able to publish it. And we were right. like, oh, this is like so funny. And that was what self-publishing was. And now it's like, no, you're getting legit books. It's almost becoming, it reminds me of like the Ingrid Michaelson of music where you're like, like you don't need a, a, you don't need a label. You can be unsigned. Yeah. And do it. I love that you do your outros in your underwear. Okay. I'm not in my underwear. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> nice try. Well, it's like a. I'm in my pajamas, which for the record is the same amount of material as a dress I'm going to wear in about 20 minutes. For but because reason, it's, it's my different. pajamas, it feels different. It's, yeah. it's different. It's like a bikini versus underwear. It's the same 
thing, but for some reason, same parts just, are covered. Same parts are covered, guys. It's just different, though. <laughs> it, there is a difference. Uh, he's not hearing a word coming out of my mouth, which, <laughs> for the record, is our superpower. Sometimes there's a there's a part of feminism that you're allowed to be like, I'm going to use this and distract you while I like, conquer the world. All right, defined feminism. Go. No, I'm not saying that. Go ahead. I'll pull Gabby on for an episode. Gabby we'll could not. Gabby is our feminist friend that s- studied feminism, right? Did she get a master's in it? Or I don't know. I don't know what her master's was in, but she's she's our most feminist or one of our most feminist friends. But and we love to, we're like super close. We love her and we love getting debates. And she has yet to be able to define feminism. So if you guys have a definition for us, go ahead and let us know because Jay likes to pick fights. He's trying to pick fight with me, but it's not going to happen. Well, my whole thing with it, I don't have a problem with it because we, I have a daughter and I want women to feel empowered. But I, I, my thing is I want everyone to feel empowered. I just want people to be like less separate, le- less labels. Right. So you should talk with more people with penises and talk to them about being more empowering for women. Wow. Is that what you want to teach your sons? <laughs> that kind of an attitude? The current political climate for us is what ends up in that people with penises that's my that's my problem with feminism it's the me versus you thing and then i get lumped into but that's the thing is that you you are this part that's the difference you are not lumped into you are the person but i have a penis therefore i'm being lumped into the the toxic masculinity thing that that is as accurate there is that thing okay that i it shouldn't is accurate, be, but uh, yeah it's to, but it's but the, here's the thing is but like, i just said you should talk to more of this this community <laughs> of yours it's not is that my community but it's my 50 percent, yeah because it is we a have male. the same wobbly bits but that's not my community wobbly are these bits. the people that i hang out with i mean trump was over the other day oh yes yeah, we're just <laughs> we're just skateboarding outside we're <laughs> Trump and I were doing, uh, you know, kickflips out front. And, uh, talking about grabbing vaginas together. And... Yeah, yeah, we were doing that. And then we were, uh, what else we were doing? We were, <laughs> we were hanging out with the Russians the day before that. Yeah, so those are your people. Yeah, that's my tribe. These are my people. Uh-huh. These are my friends. That's one of those double standards that you can't just lump. <laughs> that's not a double standard. It goes the other way, too. That, no, you can't just say, I can't just say, oh, all of oh, you so guys you... with vaginas, blah, blah, blah. Oh, so you never say... Um, Oh, it it often is just more comfortable for women to be doing these roles. You say that shit all the time. Yeah, tell me if I'm wrong. I say the exact same thing on both sides. Well, exactly. You're lumping. It's a, that's no, the that's concept. not lumping. I you say, are. What? Give me an example. Oh well, I'm not gonna. It, it's you will say things like, "Let's be honest. Like it is often more comfortable for women to be doing some of like these in home roles." No, I'll correct you. I will say that I. Have said that I wouldn't hire a man for some of those roles. There's a difference because I do feel like there is an aspect of like that male predatory thing, which I fight very strongly which to not be a part of. Which is switching, which is now we're just. I mean, I'm not like defending women in this sense. There's there is a lot a, of women. I'm going to stop you predators. for a second. There is a difference in women saying, being arrested as high school teachers all the time for sleeping true. with 14 year olds. That is definitely a double standard for sure. How is that a double standard? I'm saying it's the exact same thing. Because if I was 14 and I had a hot teacher that wanted to get, she with would me, be arrested and in jail. She'd be arrested, and I'd be like visiting her in jail, saying. But oh. that's what that's. <laughs> for the record, we have a friend who did that. We Do we? switched. Yeah, the husband. Do I, do I have this friend? Yeah, her husband was in jail for that, and she... Uh, her, yes, her husband was. However, I'm saying it's a double standard. And she was super stoked to have a super hot high school teacher boyfriend, and... I'm saying it's if it was reversed, there is a stigma that it's cool. Not anymore. That's your stigma. That's no, your No, with, with guys, it's considered like, oh, that's cool. Okay, if my 14-year-old cool. friend was sleeping with my hot it's not cool. 22-year-old teacher, I'd be like, you're cool. I'm saying it's not cool. However, I mean, like he's a rapist, but you're cool because he's super hot. There's like, there's no double standard here. This is the same. It goes both ways. You're setting those. That's like a, we're getting into You're not it. understanding you me. You pulled me right into this bullshit. I love it. <laughs> you know, I love this stuff. You're so mad. <laughs> but I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm just saying as a man, if you were a, if you were like a, let's say a 16 year old boy and you have a 21 year old hot teacher mm-hmm. and you're able to sleep with her, mm-hmm. that's Got some street cred to it. Same, ver- same with the other way around. Hey guys, we're doing some kind of weird debate thing going on here. Do you, Do you guys, want to join can in? Can you guys tell everyone what's happening with our pet squirrel? Okay, someone tell, tell us what's happening here. Tell them. A squirrel is climbing on our house. Grayson, how do you feel about that? 
Sad. Sad. <laughs> Judah, how do you... Oh, Judah. It was, Judah. it was climbing on the, the window door. Whoa. Judah, what do you think? Oh, nothing. What else? Have, um, Poopy. I knew that was coming. All right, Summer. We, we need, Summer, we need your opinion here. Come here. Go on the microphone. So, if... Abraham wanted to marry Mrs. Larson. Would that be okay? <laughs> no. No. See, there you go. There you have there it. There you have it. No. <laughs> if, her, if her five-year-old best friend would yeah. marry her, her 50-year-old teacher, we are definitely against that. So, so there you have we've it. We've drawn a line. A definitive line in the sand. A definitive line. Do Holy not cross moly. that line. Mommy, this is climbing on the window because he thought this was a he the thought squirrel. your mirror was a sandwich? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Maybe the squirrel a thought. Poop, uh, um, a squirrel <laughs> pooped on our deck. It did. It did, Judah? They, and what does their poop look like? It's so weird. Um, um poop. poop um, like a water fountain. Poop like a wow. water fountain. <laughs> Maybe you wow. have to give them some more fiber or something. Yeah. Or perhaps less, right actually. Here. All right, guys. So we are going to, I think that's good. All right. We've so I guess totally that's our <laughs> Dale's episode. On... Sorry, Dale. I don't know what happened with your outro. We really liked your episode a lot. Holy it was actually moly. great. Thank you, But um, everyone have a great week. Peace. Say bye. Poopy Dale. Poopy Dale. <laughs> Thanks, guys. We hope you loved that episode. Um, if you did love it and could give us some love on iTunes, that would be amazing. You can leave a review and we will give you a shout out at some point on this podcast. Also, if you guys can follow us on social media, we would love to hear from you. We are on pretty much every social media platform at Shifting Perceptions Podcast which is the same as our website, shiftingperceptionspodcast.com. We look and reply to all comments, so please share with your friends, tag us. We appreciate all the love. And don't forget that all of our guests also see all these comments, so I'm sure if you want to just have a space you can reach out, these are the places to do it. Um, we also want to give some love to our amazing photographer that has done all of our photos so far. Kevin Rigby. Kevin Rigby. Um, his website is wavelightstudio. LLC.com. Dot com. And also our really good friend, John Harvey, who did the music for our podcast. You can find him at Instagram at Harvey Wallbanger. So that's our uh, little rolling credits. We will be back next week.